Welcome back to News Talk. A lot of big names are running for the House seat being vacated by Maryland Democrat Chris Van Hollen. We will meet and get to know all the major candidates over time. Joining us today, a veteran of state politics, a longtime member of the Maryland House, Kumar Barbe. He has served in the House of Delegates since 1990, including a lengthy stint as majority leader, now chairman of a powerful committee. As we like to say, welcome back. Good to see you. It's great to be back. You and I started uh, the same year. Yeah, we did. I, I covered your race for the Maryland House in 1990. That yes. was when I got my start covering uh, local politics. That's that, right. You, I mean, got to, you got to see me as an underdog come out of the pack and win. And you got to see me as someone who had no idea, even <laughs> almost as little idea what he was doing as <laughs> is, is, is the case today. Welcome back. Oh, good no. You. Good, to have, good to have you here. Great to be here. You were in the studio just now for our conversation with Miranda Spivak. Mm -hmm. um, any reaction to, to what we just heard as it relates to Maryland in particular or general in terms of well, you know, the, the lobbying questions, the integrity, yeah. the transparency, and the rest? Well, you know, one of the things we did in the Maryland General Assembly is we always create an opportunity for people to come by and testify. We have always created, uh, post, uh, posted on the Internet the, uh, the votes on the House floor, and we our portal is, makes it very easy for people to follow where bills are in the process. Uh, you know, we can always improve. And one of the problems or challenges with new technology is that a law that made a lot of sense in 1995 or 1999 now no longer makes as much sense in the era of Google and Twitter and Facebook. And so we're always upgrading, and I expect that we will continue to do that. As I mentioned in the prior segment, there was a, a powerful uh, state senator who had a huge role in determining how much money each agency got and during his time in office he would lobby the agencies and then he lost an election as a result right but I was able to get that information from that folder that Miranda referenced in Annapolis right. because I was there all the time mm -hmm. in 2015 should someone have to drive from Garrett County to Annapolis to look at a folder no and I think that's an improvement we have to implement um, Talk, if you would, about uh, your bid for the Maryland for the sure. for the United States Congress. Yeah. Most of us look to Congress, look at think of Congress, and we think of dysfunction. We think of a place where, in many cases, well-meaning people uh, go mm -hmm. with the best of intent and mm -hmm. hit a brick wall mm -hmm. uh, because of the gridlock and the acrimony, etc. Why do you? Why well, do you? Can, why do you? You know, you're the powerful chairman yeah. in Annapolis. You're in a position of influence now. Mm -hmm. Why risk? Are you? Are you? Are you up for re-election next year? No, I'm oh, not. So you're not risking it all. Okay, <laughs> that's good to know. But why? Why run for the House? Why run for Congress? Well. The positive thing is it can only get better, right? <laughs> Look, let me let me just say to you that um, the two biggest problems in America are income inequality and global warming, and we've. We've made strides, and as a business person, as an accountant who's created jobs and created entities like TEDCO that create high-paying, high-technology jobs in Maryland, I want to use those skills at the national level. You know, Bruce, a lot of people don't know this, but there are four million jobs in America that are going unfilled because we don't have people qualified to fill them. I want to run for Congress because I want to, number one, get us back into the business of training and educating people for these fantastic jobs, many of which are greater than $50,000 uh, a year in salary and don't require a four-year college education. I want to work hard on taking on the monster of student debt. It's a $1.2 trillion problem that we have to fix quickly, otherwise it's a drag on our economy. And third, global warming. I have been the leader in fighting global warming and doing it in a way that creates jobs because, you know, I want for my legacy to be that I drove the wooden stake through the heart of the argument that we have to choose between great jobs for the middle class and a clean environment. It's not true, and I want to disprove it. How do we tackle this problem once we uh, overcome, if we're able to, mm -hmm. the political hurdles? And I think they're more political than scientific they, at this point. I mean, yes, that's they are. The, that's the sense that I get. Right. How do we do that in a way that doesn't hurt the economy, that sure. doesn't hurt jobs and job growth? Well, let's talk about jobs first, because that is a gigantic problem that is driving wage and opportunity and equality in America. There is a common ground between the labor community and the National Chamber of Commerce. That's the deal that has to be struck, where we explain that if, rather than spending $800 billion fighting an unnecessary war in the Middle East, we take a fraction of that and spend it on our middle class, it'll be 
good for business and it'll be good for the middle class and for labor because right now, for example, Pepco can't fill $100,000 a year lineman jobs because kids coming out of high school can't pass their exams. There are great paying jobs that don't. How much do they make? $100,000 a year at the end of a seven year apprenticeship program. But you know what? That's a great opportunity, and as a nation, we should be investing in that sort of thing. You know, we're a nation that does impossible things. We went to the moon. We ought to make fighting global warming the Apollo program of, the, of this generation. America, when it sets its mind to solving problems, does so. I want to be a voice for resetting the way we think about our problems and turning them into opportunities. What can Washington do in the next cycle mm -hmm. to help the struggling middle class? Well, the number one thing, as I mentioned, is job training, especially in the uh, community college setting. I think what President Obama has said about making community college free for people who need it is a good goal for us to aim for as a nation. Number two, I think we really have to control the whole issue of student debt and student loans. You know, the fact that we have 1.2 trillion dollars of student debt sitting out there means that's working as an anchor on the American economy. When you have that kind of debt, you can't borrow money for your first home. We as a nation have to consider innovative solutions like perhaps having the federal government go in and to start to refinance some of these uh, if, if homeowners can refinance and many people have mm -hmm. refinanced multiple times that's right taking advantage of this remarkable period we're in where right. interest rates are so low it seems like I, I've never heard of a, of a, of a graduate or, or anyone with, with student debt right. being able to take advantage of that that's is right. that because we value bank income more than it's because helping, we, giving it, giving the, the new generation of workers a helping hand you know the reason we have 30-year fixed rate mortgages is not because the market created them it's because the US federal government passed laws that made it and institutions like Freddie Mae and F Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that made those kind of uh, instruments uh, financially feasible we have to relook at student debt the same way we looked at mortgage loans during the Great Depression because honestly this is a problem that is on that same kind of scale does president I want to talk overseas for a moment does sure. President Obama have the authority under prior resolutions passed by the Congress relating to Iraq and Afghanistan mm -hmm. can he rightfully in your view use that power now to put troops into Syria and if he does mm -hmm. is, there, is it wise policy is our 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 interest there so uh, significant I, to I, justify? I believe he does have that authority, but it is not something I would advise. I don't think we should have boots on the ground in, in the Middle East. Uh, it, is a, it is an extension of a bad public policy to have gone to war in Iraq in the first place. And I don't feel, except for protecting our ally, the state of Israel, the United States should not be involved with boots on the ground. Well, I don't think we should have boots on the ground in the Middle East, period. And I, I feel that rather than focusing primarily on the Middle East, we ought to be focusing on the Indo-Pacific region, which is where two-thirds of the GDP of the world is going to be generated over the next generation. That's where the future of American progress and technology and, uh, and uh, economic uh, dynamism is, is going to be centered. And I think the President was correct in executing what he called his pivot to the Asian region. You're running in a primary that has drawn a lot of uh, big names, a, yeah. a lot of people with uh, uh, resumes that are, that are impressive, names we know. Sure. Why should voters select Kumar Barzai sure. and not some of the other names they might see on the ballot that they might connect with in, in, in some sense? You know, we're all liberals, but I'm an accountant. I'm the chief financial officer of a company, a hazardous waste disposal environmental company in Rockville, Maryland. I have a track record professionally in creating jobs, but I also have a track record in creating institutions that create jobs. Most people have never heard of TEDCO. That's an organization that I helped to create in law that literally gives an opportunity for scientists at the University of Maryland, at Hopkins, at federal laboratories to take their ideas and turn them into real jobs. Yeah, you may not know this, but my grandfather came to this country from India. He became a research scientist for uh, General Electric. He and his colleagues perfected television broadcast technology 
But, you know, let me tell you the dark side of the story. The U.S. Supreme Court stripped him of his U.S. citizenship, and he had to go back and fight to retain his citizenship. My grandfather, in spite of his contributions, had to fight to stay here, and that's still a problem in America today. You'll be a state, we have a minute left, we, you'll be a state delegate representing Montgomery County in January as you campaign. Uh, is the number one issue trying to restore the uh, uh, education formula yeah. that benefited Montgomery County? Yes. Uh, education, training and innovation are at the key of progress in our society. Restoring that, mo that money should be restored immediately, period, end of statement. Democrat Kumar Barve is a member of the Maryland House of Delegates. He's running for the congressional seat being vacated by Congressman and Senate hopeful Chris Van Hollen. We'll be talking with all the major candidates over time and maybe we'll get to put together a debate between now and primary. That'd be great. Day. The primary is in the spring. April 26th. April 26th. April 26th. Good to know. Thank you, sir. Thanks okay. very much for your time. Good Great to see you, as always. Appreciate your coming in. We'll step aside. Back with more news talk right after this.